Oblomov by Ivan Goncharov Chapter 5 Continued Oblomov dreamed that, aged seven, he awoke in his little cot at home. He felt merry and full of life. What a goodly, handsome, plump youngster he was, with cheeks of such rotundity that, however desperately any other young scamp might have tried to rival them by inflation of his own, no competitor could possibly have succeeded. Oblomov's nurse had long been waiting for him to awake, and now she began to draw on him for his stockings. This he refused to allow her to do, which end he attained by frisking and kicking, while she tried to catch hold of his leg, and the pair laughed joyously together. Finally, she lifted him onto her lap and washed him and combed his hair, after which she conducted him to his mother. On seeing his long-dead parent, the sleeping Oblomov's form trembled with delight and affection, and from under his unconscious eyelids there stole and remained two burning tears. Upon him his mother showered affectionate kisses, and gazed at him with tender solicitude to see whether his eyes were clear and healthy. Did he in any way ail, she inquired? Had he, this to his nurse, slept quietly? Or had he lain awake all night? Had he had any dreams? Had he been at all feverish? Lastly, she took him by the hand and led him to the sacred icon. Kneeling with one arm around his form, she prompted him in the words of the prayers, while the boy repeated them with scanty attention since he preferred, rather, to turn his eyes to the windows, whence the freshness and scent of a lilac tree was flooding the room. "'Shall we go for a walk today, Mamma? suddenly he asked. "'Yes, darling,' she replied hastily, but kept her gaze fixed upon the icon, and hurriedly concluded the sacred formula. Yet into the words of that formula her very soul was projected, whereas the little one repeated them only in nonchalant fashion. The prayer over, they went to greet his father, and then to take morning tea. Beside the table, Oblomov could see seated the aunt of eighty who had always lived with them. Never did she cease to grumble at the ancient serving-maid who, her head trembling with senility, stood behind her chair to wait upon her. Also there were present three old maiden ladies who were distant relatives of his father's. A weak-minded gentleman named Chekmenev, who, the brother-in-law of Oblomov's mother, was the owner of seven serfs and happened to be staying with Oblomov's parents, and certain other old men and women. The latter, the domestic staff and retinue of the Oblomov family, caught hold of the little Ilya Ilyich and started to heap him with caresses and attention, so much so that he had much ado to wipe away the traces of these unsought kisses. Then there began the feeding of the child with rolls, biscuits, and cream, after which his mother bestowed upon him another embrace and sent him out to walk round the garden and the courtyard and the lake, accompanying her farewell with particular instructions to the nurse that never must she leave the child alone for a single moment, nor yet must she allow him to approach the horses, the dogs, or the goat, nor yet must she take him far from home. Above all things, never must the nurse suffer him to approach the ravine, which was the most dreaded spot in the neighborhood, and bore an evil reputation. Once there had been found there a dog which confessed itself a mad one, inasmuch as it had run headlong from folk who chased it with hatchets and pitchforks, and it disappeared behind a neighboring hill. Likewise to the ravine carrion was carted, while robbers and wolves and various other creatures which never existed in the world at all were supposed to dwell there. But to these warnings of his mother's the child paid little heed. Already he was outside, in the courtyard. With gleeful surprise, as though for the first time in his life, he went the round of his parents' establishment, with its gates sagging outwards, its dinted roof where lichen grew, its tottering veranda, 
its various annexes and outbuildings, and its overgrown garden. Also, he yearned to ascend to the hanging gallery which girdled the house, that thence he might see the river. But the gallery was now in decay, and scarcely able to hold together, so that none but the servants trod it, and at no time did the gentry walk there. Heedless of his mother's warnings, however, the little Oblomov was on the point of making for its seductive steps when the nurse showed herself on the veranda and caught hold of him. Next he rushed from her towards the hayloft with the intention of scaling its steep ladder, and just had she time to destroy the successive schemes of ascending to the pigeon coat, of penetrating to the cattle yard, and, heaven preserve us all, of making his way to the ravine. "'God bless the child!' exclaimed the nurse. "'Will you be quiet then, young sir? You ought to be ashamed of yourself!' Indeed, the whole day, as well as every day and every night, was spent by her in similar alarms and excursions, in alternations of torture and relief on the child's account, in terror because he had fallen and broken his nose, in gratification at his warm, childish caresses, and in dim anxiety concerning his ultimate future. Only these and like emotions made her old heart beat, and her old blood grow warm. Only these retained in her the drowsy life which, but for them, would long ago have flickered out. Yet the child was not always mischievous. Sometimes he would grow suddenly quiet as, sitting beside her, he gazed fixedly before him with his childish intellect taking in the various phenomena which presented themselves to his vision. Such phenomena were sinking fast into his mind, to grow and ripen there, even as it grew and ripened. The morning was a splendid one, and the air still fresh, since the sun had not yet attained much height. From the house, from the trees, from the dovecote, and from the gallery there streamed long shadows which formed, in the garden and in the orchard, cool corners which invited meditation and sleep. Only in the distance a rye field was glowing with flame, and the river sparkling and flashing in the rays of the sun until actually it hurt the eyes to look at it. Why is it so dark in one place and bright in another? asked the child. Will it soon be bright everywhere? Yes, that is because the sun has come out to meet the moon, and at times keeps frowning because he cannot catch sight of her. By and by he will catch sight of her. Then he will send out his light once more. The child pondered and gazed at the scene around him. Before him he could see Antip driving the water cart, with another Antip, ten times as large as the real one, accompanying him, and the barrel of the cart looking as large as a house, and the horse's shadow covering the whole of the pond. Then the shadow seemed to take two strides across the pond, and then to move behind the hill, though the figure of Antip had not yet left the courtyard. In his turn the child took a couple of strides, and then a third, to see if he too would end by disappearing behind the hill, which he had a great longing to ascend, for the purpose of ascertaining what had become of the horse. Consequently, he set off towards the gates, but only to hear his mother calling from a window, "'Nurse! Nurse! Do you not see that the boy has just run out into the sunshine? Pray bring him back into the shade, or he will get a sunstroke, and be ill, and sick, and unable to eat. Besides, he might run down into the ravine.' "'Oh, the naughty darling!' the nurse muttered to herself as she dragged him back onto the veranda. The child looked about him with the keen, observant glance of a grown-up who is debating how best a morning can be spent. Not a trifle, not a circumstance, escaped the child's inquisitive attention, so that insensibly the picture of his home life engraved itself upon his mind, and his sensitive intellect nourished itself on living examples, and involuntarily modeled its program of life on the life which surrounded it. 
Never at any time could it be said that the morning was wasted in the Oblomov's establishment. The sound of knives in the kitchen as they minced cutlets and vegetables reached even to the village, while from the servants' quarters came the hum of a spindle, coupled with the thin, low voice of an old woman, but a voice so low that with difficulty could one distinguish whether she were weeping or whether she were merely improvising to herself a mournful song without words. Also, on Antip returning with the water cart, there would advance to meet it, with pails, cans, and pitchers, a number of maid servants and grooms, while from the storehouse an old woman would a vessel of meal and a pile of eggs and carry them to the kitchen. There, on the cook suddenly throwing some water out of the window, the cat, Arapka, which, with eyes fixed upon the view, had spent the morning in agitating the tip of her tail and licking herself, came in for a splashing. The head of the family, too, was not idle, for he spent the morning in sitting by the window and following with his eyes everything which took place in the courtyard. Hi, Ignashka, what have you there, you rascal? he cried to a man who happened across the open space. Some knives to be sharpened in the scullery, the man replied without looking at his master. Very well, then, mind you sharpen them properly. Next, the master stopped one of the maidservants. Where are you going? he inquired. To the cellar to get some milk for the table, she replied, shading her eyes with her hand. Good, he pronounced, and see that you don't spill any. You, Zakarka, where are you off to once more? This is the third time I have seen you gadding about. Go back to your place in the hall. Whereupon Zakarka returned to her daydreams at the post mentioned. Again, as soon as the cows returned from pasture, old Oblomov was always there to see that they were properly watered. Also, when, from his post at the window, he chanced to observe the yard dog chasing one of the hens, he hastened to take the necessary measures against a recurrence of such conduct. In the same way, his wife was fully employed. For three hours she discussed with Averka, the tailor, the best ways and means of converting the waistcoat of her husband's into a jacket for her son, herself drawing the requisite lines in chalk, and seeing to it that Averka should pilfer not a morsel of the cloth. Thereafter she passed to the maids' rooms, where she parceled out to each damsel the day's portion of lace-making, whence she departed to summon one of her personal maids to attend her in the garden, for the purpose of seeing how the apples were swelling, which of them had fallen or were turning ripe, which trees wanted grafting or pruning, and so forth. But her chief care was the kitchen and the dinner. Concerning the latter, she consulted the entire household, including the aged aunt. Each member of the family proposed a special dish, and the sum of these proposals was taken into consideration, adjudicated upon in detail and adopted or rejected according to the final decision of the mistress. From time to time, also, a maid was dispatched to the culinary regions to remind the cook of this, or to tell her to add that, or to instruct her to change the other, while conveying to her sugar, honey, and wine for flavoring, and also seeing to it that the said cook was using everything which had been measured out. In fact, the supervision of food was the first and the principal domestic preoccupation of Oblomovka. What calves were not fattened for the year's festivals? What poultry was not reared? What forethought and care and skill were not devoted to the consumption of comestibles? Game fowls and pullets were set apart solely for birthdays and other solemn occasions, wherefore they were stuffed with nuts. For the same reason, geese were caught several days beforehand and hung up in bags until wanted, in order that, being restrained from exercise, they might put on the more fat. And what a roasting and a pickling and a baking would sometimes take place, and what mead and kvass were there not brewed, and what pies were there not compounded. Until noon, therefore, everything at Oblomovka was in a state of bustle and commotion. Life was indeed full and ant-like and in evidence. 
Even on Sundays and holidays, these labor-loving ants did not desist from their toil, for on such days the clatter of knives in the kitchen sounded louder and more rapid than ever. A maid made several journeys from the storeroom to the kitchen with double quantities of meal and eggs, and in the poultry run an added amount of cackling and of bloodshed took place. Likewise, on such days, there was baked a gigantic pie, which was eaten by the gentry on the same and the following days, and by the maids on the third and fourth, after which, should it survive to the fifth day, the last stale remnants, devoid of stuffing, were given as a special favor to Antip, who, crossing himself, undauntedly attacked the rock-hard fragments, though it was in the thought that it had recently been the gentry's pie rather than in the pie itself that he took most delight. Even as an archaeologist rejoices to drink even the poorest wine from the shell of a thousand-year-old vessel. All this the boy noted with his childish, ever-watchful mind. He perceived that, after mornings thus usefully and busily spent, there ensued noon and dinner. On the present occasion noontide was sultry, and not a cloud was in the sky. Indeed, the sun seemed to be standing still to scorch the grass, and the air to have ceased to circulate, to be hanging without the slightest movement. Neither from tree nor lake could the faintest rustle be heard, and over the village and the countryside there hung an unbroken stillness, as though everything in them were dead. Only from afar could a human voice be distinguished, while, some twenty sajans away, the drone of a flying beetle with the snoring of someone who had sunk into the thick herbage to enjoy a refreshing sleep came gently to the ear. Even the house was possessed by a silence as of death, for the hour of postprandial slumber had arrived. The boy's father, mother, and aged grandaunt, with their attendants, could be seen disposed in various corners, and, should any one not possess a particular corner, he or she repaired either to the hayloft, or to the garden, or to a cool resting place among the growing hay, or, with face protected from the flies with a handkerchief, to a spot where the scorching heat would assist digestion after the enormous dinner. Even the gardener stretched himself out beneath a bush by the side of his plot, and the coachman in the stable. Little Oblomov proceeded to peep into the servants' hall, where the inmates were sleeping as though slumber had become an epidemic. On the benches, on the floor, and on the threshold they slept, while their children crawled about the courtyard and fashioned mud pies. Indeed, the very dogs had crawled into their kennels, since there was no longer anyone to bark at. In short, one might have traversed the entire establishment without meeting a single soul, and everything in it could with ease have been stolen and removed in carts from the courtyard, since no one would have been there to prevent the deed. The prevailing lethargy was all-consuming, all-conquering, a true image of death. Seeing that, but for the fact that from various corners there came snores and different notes and keys, everyone seemed wholly to have departed this life. Only at rare intervals would someone raise his head with a start, gaze around him with vacant eyes, and then turn over to the other side. 